Chapter 16 of Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack by Frank Benton. Chapter 16. Catching a Maverick. One day, while waiting for a gravel train going west, we all got to talking about catching mavericks. Eat em up Jake said he'd always been too honest to go out on the range and hunt mavericks. Dilbury Ike said he was too, but he wasn't so durned honest as to let a maverick chase him out of his own corral. And they asked me what I thought about branding mavericks. I told them that I thought it was a bad practice to hunt mavericks all the time, but whenever a maverick came around hunting me up, I generally built a fire and put a branding iron in it to heat. But I told them I would always remember one maverick I had an adventure with, and after they had all promised me not to ever tell the story to anyone, I told them the following. One hot day in the spring of 84, I started across the hills from my ranch to town, 15 miles away. I generally had a a good riata on my saddle, but this day, for some reason, I didn't take along anything but a piece of rope fifteen feet long. I didn't expect to meet any mavericks, as it was uh, just after the spring roundup, and there wasn't a chance in a hundred of seeing one. My way was across a high, broken country without a house or a ranch the entire distance. There was bunches of cattle and horses everywhere, eating the luxuriant grass, drinking out of the clear running streams of mountain water, or lying down too full to eat or drink any more. I was riding one of my best hosses, as everybody did when they went to town, had my high-heeled boots blacked till you could see your face in them, was wearing a brand new twelve-dollar Stetson hat that was made to order, had on a pair of new California pants, they were sort of a lavender color with checks an inch square, and I was more than proud of them. I had on a white silk shirt and a blue silk handkerchief round my neck, a red silk vest with black polka dots on it, but didn't have any coat to match this brilliant costume, so it was in my shirt sleeves. I rode along, setting kind of sideways, my hat cocked over my ear, uh, looking down at myself from time to time, and I was about the most self-satisfied cowpuncher ever was. Didn't envy a saloon keeper in the territory, and saloon keepers had as much influence in Wyoming them days as a sheepman does now. And that's saying all you can say when it's known that the sheepmen today in Wyoming fill almost every office, elective and appointive. Well, I had got about halfway to town and was studying but a girl I bid goodbye to in the East fifteen years before and sort of wishing she would come see me now, when all of a sudden I looked up, and right there, not fifty feet away, was a big, fat, black bull maverick. He was about a year and a half old, and would weigh eight hundred pounds. He was wild as an elk, and had given a loud snuff on seeing me, which had called my attention to him. I immediately commenced making that short piece of rope into a lasso. There wasn't much more than enough for the loop, but I knew old Bill, the hoss I was riding, could catch him on any kind of ground, so throwed the spurs in and went sailing over the brakes and coolies after that wild bull maverick. I soon caught up with him, but found it almost impossible to throw the loop over his head with such a short rope as he dodged to one side or the other every time I got in reach. However, I finally got it over his horns just as he went over a bank, but before I could take any dallies, he jerked the rope out of my hands and was gone with it. Now I had got to pick up the rope, and as it only dragged five or six feet behind him, I would have to ride by him and grab the rope near his head as I went by. But he was still on the dodge, and I made several passes at it and missed. The bull was getting mad by this time, and lowering his head and elevating his tail, he soon had me on the dodge. Whenever I wasn't chasing the bull, he was chasing me. Thus we had it, up one gulch and down another. Many times I grabbed the rope only to have it jerked out of my fingers, but finally got a wrap around my saddle horn and a knot tied. It never had occurred to me that I couldn't throw him with that short rope till I was tied hard and fast to him, and riding down the gulch at breakneck speed 
with that black bull a close second. We had been chasing each other now for over an hour, and my hoss was getting tired, but Mr. Bull seemed to be fresher than ever. I had lost my new Stetson hat early in the game, and as we had soused through a good many alkali mud holes, I was spattered from head to foot with mud. My white silk shirt and lavender-colored pants were a total wreck. But something had got to be done, and watching the bull till he was veering a little to the left of my hoss, I made a quick turn to the right, and stopping right quick, turned Mr. Bull over on his back. Before he could get up, I was off and on top of him, had his tail between his hind legs, my knees in his flank, and, as every cowpuncher knows, I could hold him down. My hoss was pulling on the rope, same as any well-trained cow hoss would, keeping the bull's head stretched out, and there wasn't the least possible show of him getting up. But as I didn't have any short foot ropes to tie his feet with, I just had to set in his flank and keep tight hold of his tail. Billy, my hoss, had got hot and excited during the race and kept surging on the rope more than was necessary. I kept saying, "'Whoa, Bill!' but directly he gave an extra hard pull the rope broke right at the bull's head and despite my nice talk billy turned his back to me and started across the hills for home in vain i hollered whoa bill come billy he never looked round but once and that was just as he disappeared over the hill he sort of looked back for a moment as much as to say well you wanted that darn little black bull so bad now you got him stay with him and that's what i had to do he was twice as hard to hold now without any rope on his head, but I knew if he ever got up he would gore me to death, and there wasn't a tree or rock to get behind. It was about noon. The hot sun was pouring down on my bare head, and I was choking with thirst. No one ever traveled that way but me, miles away to any habitation. There I would have to stay in that stooping position, holding on to that little black bull's tail. I was young and strong, but my back began to ache. My hand would cramp, clasping that bull's tail so tightly, but still I held on somehow, for I knew certain death awaited me if I let go. A bunch of cattle came along and circled around me, with wide-eyed astonishment, then trotted off. A couple of antelope came running over the hill, and catching sight of me in that ridiculous position, their curiosity overcame their timidity, and they kept getting nearer and nearer, till only a few rods away, the old buck antelope stopped and snuffed very loudly and stamped with his forefeet, but not being able to get any response out of the black bull and me, finally left. Then a silly jackrabbit came hopping up on three legs, and after standing up several times on his hind legs as high as possible and pulling his whiskers some, he shook his big ears as much as to say, It's beyond me, and he too left. Just then the bull took a new fit of struggling, and I heard the loud buzz of a rattlesnake behind me. I almost dropped my holt on the bull's tail then, but I had acquired the habit of holding on to it by this time, so glanced over my shoulder to see how far the snake was from me. I discovered he was only about ten feet behind me, coiled up, and mad about something. He was about four and a half feet long and big around as my wrist and didn't seem to have any notion of going round, but just laid there, coiled up, and every time the bull or me moved, would begin to rattle and draw his head back and forth, run out his tongue, and act disagreeable. Several times he started to uncoil and crawl in my direction, but I stirred up the bull to floundering around and bluffed the snake out of coming any closer. Still he seemed to like her company and finally went to sleep, but every time I and the bull got to threshing around, he would drowsily sound his rattle, as much as to say, I'm still here, don't crowd me any. It was now about two o'clock in the afternoon. I felt a kind of a gunness in my stomach, but my thirst was something awful, and in my mind's eye I could see the boys in town setting in the card room of the saloon around the poker tables behind the stacks of red, white, and blue chips, drinking scotch highballs, while I was out on that high mesa dying of thirst and holding down a little black bull maverick, with nothing for company but that old fat rattlesnake, who insisted on staying there to see how the bull and I come out. I hoped against hope that when old Billy arrived at the ranch, someone would start back with him to hunt me up, 
but I remembered that most everybody at the ranch had gone up in the mountains trout fishing and wouldn't be back till night. And then I wondered which would live the longest, me or the bull. And I thought about slipping away from him while he was quiet. But the moment I would loosen up on his tail, he would commence threshing around trying to get up. Still, I kept fooling with him. I'd loosen up on his tail, and then when he tried to get up, throw him back. So pretty soon he didn't pay any attention when I loosened up, and I thought I would try a sneak. However, in order to make him think I still had hold of his tail, I tied the end of it into a hard knot. I looked around for his snake ship, and as I had got to sneak back towards him, but he was sound asleep, and as the bull was pretty quiet, I sized up the country back of me and spied a gulch with steep broken banks about 150 yards away, and made up my mind that that was the place to get to. So, slipping by the snake, I made the star run of my life for that gulch. I had run about fifty feet when that bull first realized some of his company was missing. Jumping to his feet, looked round and caught sight of me, and giving a snuff that I can hear in my dreams to this day, he was after me. Talk about running. I remember a jackrabbit jumped up in front of me, but I hollered to him to get out of the way. The bull caught up before I quite got to the gulch, but hesitated for a moment where to put his horns and sort of throwed his head up and down for a time or two like he was practicing, kind of getting a swing like throwing a hammer. When he got his neck to working good, biff, he took me, and I went sailing through the air, but when I come down, it was on the bank of the gulch, but before he could pick me up again, I was over and under that bank. It was about fifteen feet to the bottom and straight up and down but there was a little shelf of hard dirt on the side, and I caught on there and was safe. He had gone clear over me into the gulch, but was up and bawling and jawing around in a minute. However, he couldn't get up to me, so looking around, found a trail leading out of the gulch and went up on top, then came round and looked down at me. He was mad clear through, went and hunted up the old rattlesnake, and after pawing and bellowing around him, charged him and got bit on the nose. Then he saw my Stetson hat, and giving a roar, went after it, and putting his horn through it, went off across the hills, mad clear through, full of snake poison, with my Stetson hat on one horn, and that was the last I saw of the little black bull. End of chapter 16, recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. Chapter 17 of Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Jackson Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack by Frank Benton Chapter 17 Stealing Crazy Heads War Ponies We all got to talking about looking over your shoulder and the boys asked me if I ever had to look over my shoulder, and I related to them the following incident in my career on the plains. In the year 1880 to 1881, the first cattle herds were driven to northern Wyoming and turned loose along Tongue River, Powder River, and the Little Horn, and while the engines in southern Montana at that time were not very hostile, yet they kept stealing our hosses and butchering the cattlemen's cattle, and committing all kinds of petty crimes, and once in a while, when they found a white man riding alone in the hills, didn't scruple to murder him. But stealing hosses was their long suit. Now I only had four hosses at that time, and was working out by the month for a cow outfit at fifty dollars a month and board. I thought everything of these four hosses, as they was the sum total of my possessions except about five hundred dollars I had due me in wages. And when these hosses was missing one day, and a hunter reported seeing a band of Indians prowling around, I was pretty well worked up. A good many of the settlers in northern Wyoming at that time had had their hosses stolen by the Indians, but when they found them in the Indians' possessions were unable to get them, as the Indians refused to give them up and would drive the white men out of their camp. I had always made a loud talk when these men related their experiences that if ever any Injuns stole my hosses and I found them in their possession, 
I'd take them hosses, and no engine would drive me a step in any direction. So when a freighter reported seeing some engines on the Little Horn River going north with my hosses, the cowboys all said now was the time for me to make good all my loud talk about taking my hosses away from the engines if they stole them. I had considerable trouble to get anyone to go with me, but finally persuaded a boy by the name of King, who was about 17 years old at the time, and getting three hosses from the outfit I worked for, which was the PK cattle outfit. We packed one of the hosses with bed and grub, and riding the other two, we struck out north down the Little Horn River. After traveling along the river for several days, we crossed and went over on the Bighorn River and keeping up this river to the Bighorn Mountains, came across about 200 engines camped at the base of the mountains. As soon as we got inside of their cayuses, we saw two of my hosses running with theirs. When we rode into their camp, they appeared friendly enough till they found out we wanted these two hosses. I could talk the engine language, and after making one of the petty chiefs of their band a few little presents, King and I went out to catch our two hosses. But they had been running with the engine's cayuses so long we couldn't get near them. Finally, we tried to drive them away from the engine's cayuses, but about 20 engines had come up to us and told us to let the hosses alone and go away. They had their guns, and while they didn't point their guns at me, they kept sticking them against King's breast and threatening to shoot if he didn't go at once. I now offered to pay them if they would catch the two hosses. Every engine wanted from 4 to $20 a piece, as there were about 20 engines that amounted to about $300. The engines rounded up all their cayuses and getting them in a safe corral caught my two hosses. I now instructed King to take the saddle off the hoss he was riding and tie the hoss to the pack hoss, and I also done this with the one I was riding. We then turned them loose and the three animals immediately started south towards Wyoming. I then told King to saddle one of the hosses that the engines had caught for us, but pay no attention to the engine who was holding it. I saddled the other animal. Two engines each had a rope on the hoss's neck. When we got them saddled and bridled, I told King to get on his and I got on mine. The engines were standing all around us as well as the squaws and papooses but they had all laid down their guns. I pulled my Winchester out of the saddle scabbard, and throwing a shell in the barrel, I told King to pull his six-shooter and cut the engine's rope that was on his hoss's neck. He said, The engines will shoot me if I do. I said, I will shoot you right now if you don't. Although he was very much excited, he managed to pull his knife out of his belt and cut the engine's rope and immediately started off after the pack hoss and saddle hosses on a dead run. The engines all set up a howl, and the squaws began bringing the guns out of the teepees. But I kept throwing my Winchester down on first one and then another. The engines kept up an awful din hollering to one another, all the squaws yelling to kill the Masacheta, white men. But I could hear the chief's voice above them all, telling them not to shoot me. The two engines, holding the hoss, having dropped their ropes, I suddenly threw the ropes off my hoss's neck and reached down, grabbing a papoose, five or six years old, and throwing it up in the saddle with me, galloped away. I knew they wouldn't shoot at me as long as I held to that papoose, but it was like holding on to a full-grown wildcat. I was carrying my Winchester in one hand, guiding my hoss with the same hand, and trying to hold on to that little biting, scratching, hair-pulling, shrieking papoose with the other. My hoss was bounding over rocks and sagebrush, but he was a magnificent animal, and in less time than it takes to tell, I was out of gunshot. And then I dropped that shrieking little engine devil on a sagebush and galloped off in the gathering darkness. I soon caught up with King. We traveled all night and the next day. Putting him onto the trail to Wyoming with all the hosses but the one I was riding, I turned north again to find the other two hosses. That day, I met a Pegan Indian that I was acquainted with, and he told me old Crazy Head's band was camped on the Yellowstone River, and that they had my other two hosses and tried to sell them to him. I rode into Fort Custer and told my story to Jim Dunleavy, 
the post scout and interpreter, and wanted him to introduce me to the post commander and get me a permit to be on the reservation. But the post commander refused to see me and sent word for me to get off the reservation, or he would put me in the guardhouse. But I struck out through the hills north, and that afternoon came in sight of Crazy Head's camp. I found an engine boy herding a large bunch of cayuses about a mile from camp, with my two hosses in the bunch. I rode into the herd and had my hosses roped and tied together before the engine had recovered from his surprise and started back south. But now a new idea took possession of me. Why not steal some Indian cayuses and get even? There was a stage line running through the reservation them days, and I knew the stock tender at the stage ranch, 15 miles from Fort Custer, at the Fort Custer battleground. So waiting till dark, I went there, and getting something to eat and leaving the two hosses, I started back to Crazy Head's camp. It was a bright moonlight night, and I found the engine's cayuses grazing in the same place. Looking around cautiously, I discovered two fine-looking coal-black cayuses grazing by themselves about 200 yards from the main bunch. Slipping up close to them, I threw my rawhide rope over one of them, and as he was perfectly gentle, started to lead him to a little patch of timber, intending to hobble him and come back and get his mate. But as soon as I started to lead him off, his mate followed him, so I just kept going till I got to the stage station, 20 miles from there, about 3 o'clock in the morning. Getting a bite to eat from the old stock tender and showing him the two cayuses I had stole, he told me he knew the cayuses and that they were old Crazy Head's war ponies. I had been in the saddle now for 24 hours without any rest, but dare not stop a moment for I knew the engines and troops both would be after me as soon as Crazy Head missed his ponies. So necking the two to my other two hosses, I started for Wyoming, 90 miles away. The Little Horn River was very high, swimming a hoss from bank to bank, and the stage hadn't been able to get through for some time. The recent rains made the ground soft, and I knew the engines would have no trouble tracking me but they wouldn't miss the ponies till 6 o'clock in the morning. So I would have 20 miles to start and certainly 3 hours of time. But there was the danger of meeting other engines who would know Crazy Head's ponies, and I might meet some scouting soldiers and have to give an account of myself, not having any permit. I didn't mind swimming the Little Horn River if I hadn't the hosses to drive. But it's a hard work for a hoss to swim in a swift current where the waves out about the middle are running big and high, as they do in mountain streams, and drive some loose hosses. But I made the hosses all plunge in and started for the other shore, 200 yards away. They all swam like ducks at first crossing, but I would have to swim the river seven times if I kept the valley, and I knew I would lose time if I went through the hills. So I kept on in a tireless lope, mile after mile, and all the time looking back over my shoulder. Now I knew the engines couldn't be in 20 miles of me, but nevertheless I kept looking over my shoulder to make sure, and I looked ahead. And every moving bush along the stream looked like a soldier or an engine, and every jackrabbit that jumped up side the road, every sage hen that flew out the grass and startled my hosses nearly made me jump out of my skin. Everything that moved in the distance looked like old Crazy Head to me. Talk about looking over your shoulder, boys. Why, my neck got in the shape of a corkscrew. Then I came to another crossing of the river. I never stopped to look at the high rolling black waters, but plunged my hosses in and struck out for the other side. I again made it in safety, and stopping just long enough to tighten my saddle cinches, took another look over my shoulder and hit that lope again, and made up my mind I wouldn't be caught. But supposing I was caught, what kind of a story could I tell? And so I tried to figure out a defense for being found with them two black hosses. I couldn't think of anything or any story but what looked fishy and showed I was a thief, and it seemed as if everyone else would know it. I remember after I became an officer of the law, several years after this event happened, I caught a poor devil skinning a beef one day that didn't belong to him. Looking up at me with guilt and terror in his face, he says, You know how it is yourself. And I said, Yes, Bill, I know how it is. 
I was a thief once, but the people are paying me now to uphold the law. Besides, I stole Injun hosses, and you are stealing white man's beef. And then at the memory of my ride on the little horn that day, I looked over my shoulder again. And when I looked back for Bill, he was gone. And somehow I was kind of glad, for I had a fellow feeling for him. But to return to my story, when I had swum the little horn the fourth time, I was forty miles on my journey. And while the iron-gray Oregon hoss I was riding seemed as fresh as ever, the black Indian pony seemed to be getting tired. When I struck the next ford on the river, I was fifty miles on the way, and it was only nine o'clock. I was feeling pretty good. But this time, when we got out about the middle of the river, where the waves were high and rolling, one of the engine ponies stopped swimming and commenced to float downstream with his nose in the water and dragging the one he was neck to with him. I started after them and by a good deal of urging got my hoss alongside, and throwing my rope on them finally towed them ashore. The pony laid in the shallow water at the shore for a long time, and I thought he was dead. But he finally came to and got up, but he was full of water and pretty groggy. I found the other two, and getting them together again, started on, but knew I would have to take to the hills now when I came to the river again, which I did, and hadn't rode over five miles in the hills skirting the river till, coming up on a high divide and looking down in the valley of the river, I saw a camp of five or six hundred engines, but they didn't see me, and I kept on until I came to Owl Creek, which empties into the Little Horn, and it was bank full of cream-colored muddy water. The banks were steep, and I couldn't guess at the depth of the water, which was of the consistency of gumbo soup. However, I drove the hosses into it, first having untied them from one another, as the buffalo trail going down into it was very narrow. As each hoss plunged in, he went completely out of sight, and I couldn't guess how far he went under water. But they all clambered up on the other bank, and I see I had got to follow them, so plunged in. As my hoss jumped off that high bank, I grabbed my nose, and under that yellow water we went. It seemed like we never would find the bottom, but finally did, and came back to the surface and scrambled up the bank. My fine buckskin shirt and leggings made but a sorry appearance. My six-shooter and holster were full of yellow mud the same as my Winchester, and it took me an hour to clean my guns and get that yellow mud off my hat and clothes. But I had no more streams to cross, except Tongue River, which is in Wyoming, and I crossed it a little after dark and got to my own ranch at 9 o'clock that evening, having ridden the same hoss 106 miles since 3 o'clock that morning. That gray hoss is still living and is 30 years old now, and is well known by all the old timers in northern Wyoming. I laid down and slept for 20 hours. And when I reported at the roundup with my four hosses and the two engine ponies besides, I got a hearty handshake all around. The boys made up a pot of a hundred dollars and gave it to me for the engine ponies, and then played a game of freeze out to see who should have them. I've never had the least inclination to look over my shoulder since. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of Cowboy Life on the Side Track. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Cowboy Life on the Side Track by Frank Benton. Chapter eighteen. The Cattle Queen's Ghost. When darkness overshadows a lone cow ranch wild and drear one's nerves they get a trembling in a way that seems so queer when you feel the spirits round you this idle them to boast you don't believe those stories you've heard about the ghosts one dark rainy evening while we were waiting on a side track the boys insisted i should tell them some adventure of mine so after considerable urging I told them an actual experience I had that has always convinced me that murdered people's ghosts come back and haunt the place they were murdered in. Twenty years ago, 
jerry wilson was known as the cattle king of the platte river his cattle roamed for hundreds of miles up and down the main river and all its tributaries and as the cowboys used to say no one man could count them even if they were strung out cause he couldn't count high enough jerry had a beautiful wife and two lovely children a boy and a girl and for years he and his family had no settled place to live but went around amongst his different ranches staying a while at each one the children being kept in school in chicago except in the summer time when they came west to stay on some cattle ranch with their parents finally jerry wilson bought a new ranch up in the south part of south dakota on battle creek and stocking it up with registered cattle and fine horses built a fine house furnished it very expensively and settled on this ranch for their home he built magnificent barns that were the talk of the whole country and spent a small fortune in building up and beautifying this ranch but one day jerry was riding his horse after a cow on a hard run the horse stepped in a badger hole and fell on top of him crushing in his ribs and otherwise injuring him so he only lived long enough to be carried to the house and bid his wife and children good-bye before he died mrs wilson mourned for jerry a long time but the care of her two children and the increasing cattle herds occupied her mind and time to such an extent that her grief had settled into a quiet sadness when a young man from new york city who had been discarded from home by his family for his profligate excesses came to battle creek and stopping at mrs wilson's ranch was as is the custom at all cattle ranches in the west made welcome to stay as long as he wanted to at this time jerry wilson had been dead seven years his daughter who was the oldest of the two children had married a prominent lawyer of chicago the son was in school in the same city and mrs wilson made her home at the battle creek ranch she had successfully carried on all her cattle enterprises and was known all over the west as the cattle queen she was about forty years old at this time still a beautiful woman and had received many offers of marriage but had rejected them all till this graceless and unprincipled scoundrel from new york whose name was clayton allen came to the ranch mrs wilson had arrived at the age where a great many women begin to hanker for a young man's society and attention and was soon violently in love with clayton allen and he seeing a chance to get hold of large sums of money to gamble and go on sprees with and knowing he could never hope to get any more from his family laid siege to the cattle queen's heart and hers with all the wiles he was capable of to make the story short mrs wilson married this worse than scamp and learned too late to regret her mistake he persuaded her first to sell all her great cattle herds and ranches and invest all the money in bonds which she did keeping only the ranch and blooded cattle on battle creek he now persuaded her to go to new york city with him and soon as they arrived he joined his old gang of profligates and spent his nights with gay men and women only coming to see her when his money was exhausted and then only long enough to get more money in vain she plead with him finally in sorrow and grief not having seen him for several days she took the train for the west and returned alone to her old battle creek home she had been home about a month staying in her room alone most of the time weeping and crying when one stormy black night clayton allen returned about ten o'clock he immediately went to his wife's rooms the servants heard loud talking and angry words between them for some time and apparently he was demanding money and she was refusing to give him any there was a large hall that ran through the centre of the house dividing the building its entire length the servants had their rooms and the dining-room was on the west side of this hall and the cattle queen had her parlours and sleeping apartments on the other side about eleven o'clock the servants heard their mistress walking up and down this hall crying and moaning but on opening their door that led into the hall found she had gone back into her rooms but clayton allen came in the hall just then and asked the housekeeper to bring a bottle of wine as her mistress was ill and wanted some the wine was brought and clayton allen taking it out of her hand at the door closed the door in her face telling her if she was wanted he would call her thirty minutes later the housekeeper heard her mistress scream for help in the hall and rushing in 
found her lying on the floor in violent spasms and picking her up carried her to the bed only to see her die the next moment the death-stricken woman only spoke once as she was being carried to the bed she whispered in the housekeeper's ear mr allen has poisoned me all of the cattle queen's money and bonds were kept in a portable safe and where she kept the keys hidden no one knew but at the funeral the lawyer from chicago who it will be remembered married jerry wilson's daughter appeared on the scene and after a consultation with the housekeeper and cowboys at the ranch clayton allen disappeared in fact the cowboys kidnapped him and kept him guarded in an old dugout for several days and when they let him go the lawyer had returned to chicago the safe disappeared at the same time the lawyer left so clayton allen never got the enormous fortune that was in the safe but he got an administrator appointed and the administrator sold the herd of fine cattle at the battle creek ranch to me as also the use of the ranch for one year and the hay i tried to get some cowboys living in that part of the country to take care of the ranch and cattle but all of them promptly refused saying they wouldn't stay there for any amount of money then i sent some of my men from my wyoming ranch where i was living at the time but in a week they came back looking shamefaced and sulky but refusing to stay at the battle creek ranch after i questioned them pretty sharply they said they didn't believe much in ghosts but the cattle queen's ghost was too much for them they said from ten thirty o'clock in the evening till after midnight she tramped up and down the hall in the house crying screaming and groaning they said the door leading from the hall to the cattle queen's rooms kept opening and shutting and they could hear her talking and expostulating with someone and walking back and forth from the hall to her rooms i had an old man working for me at the time who was almost totally deaf so i sent him and my own son georgie who was a manly brave little fellow of twelve years to the ranch i had a talk with george before they started and told him all about it i said someone was trying to buy the ranch cheap and was making these disturbances in order to give the ranch the name of being haunted but in a week i got a letter from my boy saying there might not be any such things as ghosts but there was certainly some kind of carrying on in the hall of that old house every night and wanting me to come up so taking my gun and dog i went up there to lay the ghost my dog was one of the largest specimens of the big blue dane breed and wasn't afraid of anything and i said to myself now i will nail these parties and convince my son while he is young that there isn't any such things as ghosts when i arrived at the ranch i found death bill as we called him and my little boy had taken up their quarters in the housekeeper's room which was in the extreme western portion of the house which was built without any upstairs all the rooms being on the ground floor i went into the hall of the house and found that the doors at each end of the hall were locked from the inside the keys being in the locks i next went into the parlors and sleeping apartment used by the cattle queen in her lifetime and where she met her tragic death and found the curtains all down and the windows closed with catch locks and screens outside of the windows everything was apparently in the same condition as when the rooms were fastened up after her death her books and pictures and paintings and wardrobe and easy chairs were all there just as if she might have stepped out expecting to be back at any moment i raised the window in her bedroom with some difficulty as i wanted to air the room a little for i had made up my mind to sleep in that bed that night in those haunted rooms and convince superstitious people that i at least wasn't afraid of ghosts i tried to get my little boy to sleep in there with me but with pale cheeks and staring eyes and chattering teeth he begged so hard that i didn't insist on it i have always been thankful that i didn't oblige him to stay with me that dreadful night when i retired about eight thirty that evening with my dog and gun into the haunted rooms i was very tired from my long drive from the railroad and setting the lamp on a stand at the head of the bed and putting my six-shooter under my pillow i called my dog to the side of the bed and laying down with my clothes on pulled some blankets over me blew out the light and immediately went to sleep how long i slept i know not but was awakened by my dog who was whining and licking my face when i first woke up i didn't remember for a moment where i was 
but the next moment heard a long-drawn sigh across the room from me and could hear somebody walking on the carpet i bounded up and had just lit the lamp when i heard someone open the door from the parlour into the hall and the next moment heard an agonizing cry for help in the hall i now grabbed the lamp and my six-shooter and running through the two parlours opened the hall door suddenly just after hearing the second cry for help and found that the hall was absolutely empty the doors at each end still being locked and the door that led into the servants part of the house was also locked from my side of the hall as i had locked it when i went through to go to bed i went back into the two parlours and sleeping apartments and searched them thoroughly even the wardrobes and clothes closets tried all the windows but there was no trace of any living person's presence i then noticed my dog he had crawled under the bed and was lying there whining in the most abject terror i dragged him out and kicked him a couple of times and told him to watch them but apparently he'd had all the ghost business he cared about for he lay at my feet trembling and whining disgusted with him i laid down again thinking i would blow out the light but be ready with my six-shooter and some matches and catch whoever it was prowling around that house trying to hoodoo the place i hadn't any more than laid down and blown out the light before my dog was trying to get out of the window back of my bed and whining piteously and then i heard a woman crying in the same room with me and coming slowly towards my bed i began to get nervous but scratched a match and in the flickering light saw that the room was absolutely empty but as the match went out i heard someone run through the parlour open and shut the door into the hall and then heard a long despairing cry for help in a woman's voice i plucked up the little courage i had left ran to the hall door opened it and lighting a match gazed up and down that empty hall seeing nothing or nobody but as the match flickered and went out there came a breath of cold air right in my face and then out of that black darkness seemingly right at my shoulder arose that awful blood-curdling cry for help again and as my blood froze in my veins my dog answered the cry with one of those long despairing drawn-out mournful howls that dogs always give as a premonition of death in the family i tottered back to the bed and vainly tried to light a match but was too nervous then hearing that light footstep and that rustling presence coming from the hall through the parlours again towards the bed i dropped the match and pulling a lot of blankets and bed covers over my head i huddled down in a heap and lay there trembling with fright and horror till the next morning when i heard my boy pounding on the outside of the window and calling me to breakfast no money would have induced me to have stayed another night on that ranch and getting an offer next day for the cattle i sold them five years afterwards i saw a man who had come by the cattle queen's ranch and he said nobody lived there the house and barns were all out of repair the fields overgrown with weeds and an air of desolation to the whole premises the administrator had finally sold the property for a song to an easterner and he moved his family up there in the daytime he had to go back to town that night for another load of his goods and when he returned to the ranch the next day he found his wife roaming around the fields a raving maniac and she is still in the asylum in south dakota they say the cattle queen's ghost still keeps entire possession and will till her murderer is punished for his crimes End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of cowboy life on the side track this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by bill mosley lano county texas u s a cowboy life on the side track by frank benton chapter nineteen Pack Saddle Jack's Death Pack Saddle Jack had got tired of filing off wrinkles one night, and not being sleepy, walked on ahead of the special till he came to a side track. Lying down there on the embankment, 
he went to sleep and caught a violent cold from which he never recovered. It settled into a bad cough, and the wrinkle dust seemed to aggravate it. Still, he insisted on taking his regular shift in spite of our remonstrances, and the harder he coughed, the harder he'd file. As the motion of filing and coughing is almost the same, he seemed to make better time coughing when he was filing, and vice versa but finally he became so weak that he couldn't leave the way car any more and we knew it would be a question of a very few days till old pack saddle would be swimming his bronc across the river sticks he became very quiet and thoughtful those days seemed to do a heap of studying and one bright sunny afternoon he called me over to his corner of the way car and told me he had a dream the night before, and it made such an impression on him he wanted to tell it to me. He said in the start of his dream he seemed to be there on the way car, planning how much he could possibly get out of what cattle was left when we got to Omaha, when it seemed, all of a sudden, there was a mighty well-dressed cowpuncher riding a big paint hoss and leading another all saddled and bridled came right up to him and says pack saddle come with me he said the stranger had on a big stetson hat a mighty nice embroidered blue shirt with red silk necktie and white fur snaps high-heeled boots and a pearl-handled forty-five six-shooter he was riding fraser's famous pueblo saddle had a split-eared bridle, and was rigged out every way that was proper. Said he asked the stranger where he wanted him to go, and the stranger told him they was going to a country where there was no sheep or sheepmen, where the grass grew every year, where the cattle was always fat, where they drove their cattle to market, place of shipping them, where hard winters, horn flies, heel flies, and mange was unknown. He said the stranger made such a square talk, he finally made up his mind to go with him, although he had some doubts, not knowing the feller. So getting on the lead hoss, he was kind of surprised to find the stirrups just his length and the saddle just fitted him. He said they started off kind of slow at first, in a little jog trot, but directly got to loping, and finally after crossing a lot of mean-looking country, they came to a big river, and his guide told them they had got to swim their horses across it, as there was no bridge. The stranger said lots of smart men had tried to build a bridge across this river, and some people had deluded themselves into thinking they knew of a bridge that they could get across on, but always when it came to crossing, they couldn't exactly locate their bridge and had to plunge in with the crowd. Packsaddle said it was a mighty ugly-looking stream. It was wide and deep and looked like it was rising. The water was black as ink, and the waves out toward the middle was rolling mountain high. Still, there appeared to be people all along the shore, a plunging in and starting for the other side. There was a large crowd scattered along, and most of them didn't seem to see the river till they fell off backwards into it. They would be laughing and cutting up with their backs to the river, and all of a sudden get too close, a little piece of bank would crumble off, and with a despairing cry they disappeared beneath the black waters and was seen no more. Some apparently mighty rich people dashed up with carriages and servants, and taking a sack of gold in each hand, would offer that to the river, thinking probably they wouldn't have to cross if they offered it some gold. But of all the people who came to the river, only a very few ever turned back, although most of them seemed to want to. He noticed a few that looked like farmers' wives who came up and 
As soon as they saw the river, a smile of content came on their faces, and they slid into the boiling water as naturally as though it was wash day. There was a class of men, too, who came up with a determined look on their countenances, and without the slightest hesitation, plunged into the awful stream and struck out for the other side. These men all had cowboy hats on, and when Pack Saddle asked his guide who they were, he said they were cowmen who had been shipping their cattle to the Omaha market, and their cattle had starved to death on the stockyard transfer waiting to be unloaded. Some there was that looked like pettifogging lawyers and cheap politicians, who, when they arrived at the river, flourished a handful of annual passes over different lines, looking for a pass over the river, but not getting it turned back and wouldn't cross, and the guide told Pack Saddle that he guessed this class of people never did cross, as they seemed to get thicker every year. Packsaddle said at first he kind of hated to cross the river, as his guide said none ever returned, and he couldn't see the other bank very plainly, and was in some doubt as to what kind of a country was on the other side, although there was hundreds of big, fat, red-faced looking men, dressed in black, standing along the shore where he was, telling everybody what kind of a country was on the other side? They differed a great deal in their description of it, but that was probably on account of what different people wanted. All these black-robed, fat-looking rascals got money out of the crowds and seemed to be doing a thriving business by fixing up people to cross and giving them encouragement. Most all of them was selling some kind of a patented life preserver to wear across the river, and each one shouted out the merits of his life preserver till their noise drowned the roar of the river, and they tried to get lots of people to cross the river that hadn't got anywhere near the bank just to sell them a life preserver. Pack Saddle had noticed all these things as they waited on the bank a moment, and then he said, they plunged their hosses in and started swimming for the other side. The other bank, he said, was sort of obscured by a mist or fog, and he didn't see it till most there, but saw worlds of all kinds of people struggling in the black water of the river. Pack Saddle said, his hoss swam high in the water, never wetting the seat of his saddle and he felt just like he was getting home from the general roundup. When they struck the bank, there was a bunch of cowboys helped his hoss up the bank, gave him a hearty handshake all around, and made him welcome every way. When he turned round to thank his guide, that gentleman had vanished, and the cowboys told him his guide was a regular escort across the river for cowmen and cowboys, that most everybody had to get across the best way they could. But cowmen and cowboys always had a good hoss to ride and a guide. That one reason for this was that they was most always mighty good to a hoss and thought a heap of them. They said, though, that there was a lot of boats with cushioned seats and mighty comfortable that brought over the poor old widder women and farmers' wives and orphan children that had been abused and starved till they just had to cross the river to get away. Packsaddle said it looked like a mighty good country, lots of fat cattle, the finest hosses he ever see, lots of cowboys laying over the mess wagon, bucking Monty and everybody winning, while the roundup cooks had pots and bake ovens steaming with roast veal, baking powder biscuits, and cherry rolls. He said the boss of one of these outfits hired him on the spot and given him a string of fat hosses to ride. He picked out a black pinto with watch eyes and saddled him. As soon as he got on his hoss, it started to buck, and he said he dreamed that hoss throwed him so high 
that he saw he was coming down on the other side of the river, and it disgusted him, so he woke up. Packsaddle was very weak when he got through telling his dream, and after taking a drink of water, he told me he thought he was all making a mistake trying to make money raising cattle. He had heard about some place in the east where they just issued stock, place of raising it, and that certainly must be the place to go. He had heard of two or three men, probably stockmen, who got together in New York City, issued just millions of stock in one day, and he was satisfied that was one thing made our stock so cheap. For himself, he said, he liked that country he saw in his dream and thought he'd go there pretty soon. While we were talking, the head brakeman came in and said there was a cow dead in the car next to the engine. Packsaddle gave a gasp or two, and when I bent down over him, he whispered he would go and round her up. And when I looked at him again, he was dead. Poor old Packsaddle. His early life had been embittered by the discovery that a married woman, whom he was in the habit of visiting in the absence of her husband down in Texas, where he was raised, was untrue to him, and on meeting his rival at the lady's house, when her husband had gone to mill with a grist of corn, he promptly filled his rival's anatomy full of lead, and came away in such a hurry that he had to borrow a jack mule and pack saddle from a man that was prospecting, and rode this pack saddle to Wyoming, and thus acquired the euphonious name of Pack Saddle Jack. Although he was cheerful at times, yet the memory of this woman's perfidy to him cast a gloom of melancholy over his afterlife, which was never entirely dispelled. He never whined when he lost his money bucking Monty, always had a good supply of tobacco and cigarette papers of his own, and never failed to pass them around. While he didn't have much love for women or engines, he loved a good hoss and twice owed his life to his hoss when he had a brush with Cheyenne Indians in early days in northern Wyoming. In a burst of confidence a few days before his death, he told me he had endured the worst kind of hardships all his life. Winter and summer he had lived on the plains and in the mountains without shelter, by open campfires, lots of times without much to eat, had been hunted and shot at for days and nights by Cheyenne Indians, and never met with the privations and discomforts he had on this trip. And as for slowness, he said he hired out one time in Texas when he was a boy, to help drive 900 tame ducks across the swamps of Louisiana to New Orleans to market. Said the trail was so narrow that only one duck at a time could walk in it, and sometimes no trail at all, just high grass and swamp brush, and yet they beat the time of a cattle special away yonder. The spirit of Pack Saddle follows the dead cow. A stock train was waiting on a side track one day for gravel trains going some other way, and as they waited, the cattle grew old, the stockmen grew haggard, the weather turned cold. Their stomachs were empty, they were starving, in fact, while the stock train was waiting on its lonely side track. The report said the markets were lower each day. While the cattle grew thinner, the stockmen grew gray. An old grizzled cattleman spoke up at last, said he to the cowboys, The time it is past, to make mun out of cattle, or get any dough, this going to market by rail is a little too slow. The railroad company's tariffs get higher each year, their passes get fewer, till I very much fear that ahead of our stock train we will have to walk and wait for the cattle train to get up our stock. <laughs>
let us up and be doing and build a big merger trust and sell stock to suckers and let them go bust and for every steer issue millions of shares let other people worry how to get railroad fares we will issue bonds and certificates and thus raise our stock in placing our breeding shorthorns we will make a swift talk have our shares all printed in red green and gold sell them in the stock market to the young and the old and thus live by our cuteness and work of our brains in place of starving on special stock trains we will have servants and waiters the best in the land governors and princes will give us the glad hand just then the front brakeman stuck in his head saying in the car next the engine an old cow was dead the old cowman gave a gasp and his spirit started to ride to round up that old cow that in the front car had just died end of chapter nineteen recording by bill mosley lano county texas u s a Chapter 20 of Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack by Frank Benton. Chapter 20 A Cowboy Enoch Arden. Just after leaving North Platte, a train of immigrants on their way from Oregon to Arkansas with mule teams went by us, and we found they had a letter for us from Edom Up Jake who had returned to Utah long ere this to look after his domestic matters. One of the reasons why he abandoned us was to return and look after the education of the twin boys. However, the main reason was that so many reports had come to us from travelers in wagons and sheep herders trailing sheep east, who had come through our neighborhood in Utah, who said that all our friends had given us up for dead, and Edom up Jake's wife, after putting on mourning for a proper season, had begun to receive the attentions of a widower who was part Gentile bishop and part Mormon elder. As Jake was in a hurry when he started back home, he bought him a cheap Mustang in place of accepting the transportation which was urged on him by all the principal officers of the railroad. He wrote us that when he arrived on his ranch, his wife was out in the hayfield putting up the third crop of alfalfa. She was driving a bull rake, hauling it into the stack, while one of the twins was driving the mower, and the other twin was doing the stacking. This half-breed Mormon Gentile bishop was standing round with a cotton umbrella over his head giving orders. Jake's wife didn't know him at first, he had changed so, but the bishop tumbled to him at once and started to leave. However, Jake overtook him and persuaded the bishop to turn aside into a little patch of timber with him. And Jake, getting the loan of the umbrella in the painful interview that followed, he left most of the steel ribs of the umbrella sticking in the anatomy of the bishop, and then let the house-dog, with the help of the twin boys armed with their pitchforks, assist the bishop clear off the ranch. This was so much better than the old style of Enoch Arden business that Dilbury Ike made up a little rhyme about it after we got Jake's letter. And here it is. In Utah, a cattleman got married in the glow of summertime, married a buxom Mormon girl, warm heart, and manner kind. And as the autumnal sun began to tinge things red, he rounded up his cattle herd, and to his bride he said, Come hither, dear, and kiss me, and sit upon my lap, for I am going a lengthy journey with my cows and steers that's fat. I'm going on the overland with a special long stock train. His bride, she wept and trembled, and said, I'll ne'er see you again. O oh, Jake, my darling husband, give up this wrong design. If you must go east with cattle, then try some other line. For I have heard the stockmen talking, and this is what they say, that if you drive your stock to market, that then there's no delay. But if you get a special train, the railroad has a knack of letting you do your running when your train is on a sidetrack. Some stockmen they have starved to death, and others grow so old, that none knew them on their return, so frequent I've been told. But Jake was young and hardy, and his mind was full of zeal, to load his beef on a special and eastward take a spiel. 
So he started with his steers and cows in the golden autumn time. Some neighbors also loaded theirs. The cattle were fat and fine. But they run the stock on the overland so slow and awful bum that stockmen get old and careworn staying with a special run. Their wives get weary waiting for hubby's coming home and flirt with the nearest preacher who drops in when they're alone. Jake's wife was no exception, and as time went by, she said, If Jake was alive, I know he'd come back. He surely must be dead. The good woman put on mourning and mourned for quite a time, but when thus she'd done her duty, she suddenly ceased to pine. And when a Gentile Mormon preacher dropped in one night to tea, she put on her new dress of gingham, and was chipper as she could be. Had him eating her pies and jellies that she knew how to make, had him sit in the easy rocker, without ever a thought of Jake. And when the twins got drowsy, she packed them off to bed, sat and played checkers with the bishop, just as though poor Jake was dead. When she jumped in the preacher's king row and had eight men to his five, she cared not, she was so excited, whether Jake was dead or alive. But at four o'clock next morning she roused from sleep with a scream. She'd seen Jake pushing behind a stock train in this early morning dream. And that evening, when the lusty preacher came hanging around again, he got but scanty welcome, for she thought of the special train. For a time she was silent and thoughtful, the dream an impression had made. She could still see Jake pushing the special, as it slowly climbed the grade. Now we know how the brave-hearted Jake with the stock train had to stay, how he camped by her side night-times as on a side-track she lay. We know how he pushed so manfully whene'er she climbed a hill. In fact, every one pushed, even the sheepmen, Cotswell and Rambolet Bill. How hunger and famine o'ertook them as slowly they crawled along. Their hearts almost broke with home-longing when Jack Dew sung a home-song. Eyes filled with tears that were unbidden, hearts o'erflowing with pain. No pen can paint their sorrow as they stayed with this special stock train. The passing of poor old Chuck Wagon, who slowly starved to death, on account of the smell of the sheepmen, he couldn't get his breath. Their camping ahead of the special after they had buried Chuck, the washing away of the sheepmen, who surely were out of luck. They lived in snow huts on the mountain that's known as Sherman Hill, where the last was seen of the sheepmen, Cotswell and Rambolet Bill. Their arrival at the Windy City, that's known as the Dead Cheyenne, some things about Bert and Warren and mayhap another man. And now with their party diminished by old age, privation, and death, they still kept plodding on eastward what of the party was left. Till Jake, talking with wandering sheepmen who had trailed by his cabin home, heard of the scandalous preacher who came when his wife was alone, heard of the nightly playing of checkers when the twins were safely in bed, about his wife all the neighbors were talking, her claiming that Jake was dead. Finally, through very homesickness, he started to take the back track, and because he was in such a hurry, he rode all the way, horseback. Arriving in sight of his meadows, a waving fresh and green, the alfalfa growing the highest that Jake had ever seen, two red-headed boys the hay were pitching. Their mother was hauling it in. There was only one blot on the landscape that made Jake feel like sin. "'Twas our Gentile Mormon bishop in the shade of his old umbrella, with his long-tailed coat and eyeglasses. He looked like Foxy Quiller. When Jake got close to the bishop, he booted him out the field. The house-dog and twins, with their hayforks, finished making the elder spiel. Then Jake gathered his family around him. Work was laid by for the day. They told all their joys and their sorrows. So I finished my lay. Moral. The old-fashioned Enoch Arden story was a tale well told. I can't approach or rival it, nor make a claim so bold. But the ending of my cowboy Enoch Arden I really liked the best, for he fired the interloper out of the modern Arden nest. End of chapter 20 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 21 of Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack by Frank Benton Chapter 21 Grand Island Before we arrived at Grand Island, we learned from Jack Dew that most cowmen unloaded their cattle there and drove them back and forth through the stockyards a while in order to accumulate a large amount of mud on them. The Grand Island mud is very adhesive, and once Steers is thoroughly immersed in it, the mud sticks to them for weeks and helps very materially in their weight. A shipper told him that before he stopped at Grand Island he used to wonder what cattlemen meant by filling their cattle at Grand Island, but now he knew it was filling their hair full of mud. Sometimes, he said, the mud was a little too thick, kind of chunky, and fell off, and sometimes it had too much water in it and drained off, more or less. But when it was mixed just right it would settle into their hair like concrete cement. It's quite dark in color, fortunately, and if they've had a rain, it is easy to get pens where you can immerse your cattle all over, and thus make them the color of the Galloways, which is the most fashionable color for cattle in the market. He said there was cases where cattlemen had got a good fill on the Grand Island mud and sold their cattle weighed up there to feeders, who put them on full feed for six months, and they weighed less in the market than to start with, because the feeders had curried the mud off them. Sometimes, he said, after people left Grand Island with their cattle and before the mud got well set, there would come a hard rain on them and the mud washed off in streaks and gave the cattle a kind of zebra appearance. Especially was this true where the cattle had originally been white. He said we would be expected to order some hay and pay for it and get the mud for nothing. It was just like a bootjack saloon where you bought a high-priced peppermint drop and got a pint of whiskey thrown in. "'Twas here at Grand Island that we met Joe Kerr again. We had met him in Utah before we shipped, and he tried very hard to get us to ship our cattle to the coming livestock market of the United States at St. Joe. Kerr travels in the interest of the St. Joe stockyards, and while in the fullness of our youth and concert, when we first loaded our stock, we wouldn't have taken a suggestion from Teddy Roosevelt. Yet we had grown older and had lost some of our self-confidence. In fact, I've often thought since these experiences that the old proverb, he who ships his range cattle to marketplace instead of selling them at home leaves hope behind would apply to most range shipments now it seems joe kerr had kept posted as to our movements right along through friends of his who were in the sheep business and who had trailed their herds past our train at different times on their trip east to sell their sheep for feeders and kerr had made such nice calculations by casting horoscopes and looking up the signs of the zodiac that he knew to a month when we would arrive in Grand Island, and was waiting there to persuade us to ship our stock to St. Joe in place of Omaha. He was right on the spot to help us unload them, knew all the pins where the mud was the deepest, even helped us smear the mud into their hair on the few spots that was missed, when we were swimming them through the mud batter. Joe had loads of statistics for sheepmen, cattlemen, horsemen, and hogmen, that would convince any man that wasn't too suspicious that St. Joe was the best market. He had beautiful colored maps of the yard showing the clear limpid waters of the Missouri River flowing along at the foot of the bluffs, the waters swarming with steamboats and smaller craft, the city of St. Joe covering the bluffs and river bottoms for miles, and just down to the river at the lower end of this great city was stockyards and packing plants laid out like some great city park and hundreds of acres, all paved with brick laid into walks and floors for the pens, with perfect precision, and all divided in different compartments for all kinds of livestock, everything arranged so sheep can be unloaded one place, hogs another place, cattle another, so as to admit of no delay in unloading when the stock arrived. He told us that their yards were kept so clean that ladies could walk all over them in rainy weather without soiling their costumes said no sheenies were skinning people in their yards. He made such a square talk we finally agreed to split the shipment and let part of the train go to St. Joe, and sent Jack Dew along to take care of the cattle. End of chapter 21. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 22 of Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack by Frank Benton Chapter 22 Serer The rainy season had now set in in good earnest all through Nebraska, 
and while the natives have typhoid fever and malaria to a more or less extent, yet most of them live through it, but people from the dry mountain regions that have been used to pure air and water all their lives fare worse from these fevers ten times over than the natives, and Dilbury Ike fell a victim right in the start. One evening, soon after we left Grand Island, I noticed his face was flushed very red, and he complained of a dull headache. But as he had the headache a good deal ever since the railroad police had scalped him at Cheyenne in mistake for a striker, I didn't think so much of his headache. But when I come to look at his tongue and feel his pulse, I found every indication of high fever. In a few hours he was out of his mind and talked of shady mountain sides, babbling brooks, and clear mountain springs of water. And he talked of his horses and cattle, his cow ranch and alfalfa meadows, but most of all he talked of Sarer. Now, Dilbury had only one romance in his life that we knew of, and that happened in this way. Several decades previous to our story, the few families living in the vicinity of Dilbury's ranch in Utah had got together and built an adobe schoolhouse, and voting a special tax on the piece of railroad track that run through their part of the country, had raised enough money to pay for the schoolhouse and hire a school teacher. At first, each of the three married women in the neighborhood wanted to teach the school. Then each of them offered to take turns about teaching it so they could divide the money. But their husbands, who was the directors, wanted a school marm, so as to have a little young female blood diffused through the atmosphere in that part of the country. And after advertising for a school teacher the New England brand preferred, got hundreds of answers very shortly. So putting their heads together they selected one that had a kind of crab-apple perfume attached to the application, and was worded in such a way as to give the reader a notion of pleading blue eyes, with a wealth of golden-brown hair, and heaving bosom, not too young to teach school, nor too old to be romantic and sympathetic, and closed a deal with her to come west and teach their school. She had signed her name Sarah Jessica Virginia Smith, but was always known as Miss Sarah. When she was about to arrive at the railroad station thirty miles away, all the married men wanted to go and meet her. All of them had particular business in at the station that day, but none of their wives would stand for it. They say that Dilbury Ike was a bachelor, and the proper one to get her. Now Dilbury Ike was a long, gangling, bashful, backward plainsman, never had a sweetheart, and was considered perfectly harmless around women by everyone who knew him. The old married men finally agreed to let Dilbury meet the schoolmarm, but not till each had went through a stormy scene with his wife, in which that good woman had threatened to tear the blanket right in two in the middle with such forcible language that you could almost hear it ripping. Dilbury had got shaved, had his hair cut, put on his best black suit he had bought from Machini, the pants being a trifle of six or eight inches too short for him at the top and bottom both, his coat rather large in the waist, but short at the wrists, like the pants, and hitching his mules to his spring wagon, he started bright and early to the station of Kelton, Utah. He arrived about noon, him and his mules, white with alkali dust, and finding that the train was twenty-three hours late, stayed at the section house till next day, there being no hotel in Kelton. When the train came along next day about noon, a large portly lady of uncertain age, with her frizzed-up hair turning gray, her hands full of wraps, lunch baskets, sofa pillows, telescope grips, umbrellas, hand boxes, and bird cages, climbed off the train, and the baggage man put off a large horsehide trunk, from which most of the hair had been worn off, or perhaps scalped off in the troublous times when Washington was crossing the Delaware. When she got this old bald-headed looking trunk and a couple of shoe boxes with rope handles that were probably full of century magazines, piled up with her other baggage, the newsboy said it looked like an Irish eviction. When Dilbury saw this old man-hunter and all her luggage, his heart failed him and he went to the saloon three times to lick her up before he got sand enough to talk to her. Of course, Dilbury expected to marry her no matter what she was like, as the whole neighborhood where he lived had planned it ever since the school marm was talked of, and he couldn't expect to disappoint the neighbors and still continue to live there. Still, she wasn't exactly what he had figured in his mind after reading a great many novels about the rosy-cheeked, small-waisted, dainty feet, lily-white hands, wondrous brown hair, blue-eyed New England darlings, with pretty sailor hats and tailor-made suits, who come west to teach our schools and, incidentally, marry the most expert roping, best bronco-busting chief cowpuncher. puncher 
and now here was this dropsical-looking old girl with fat pudgy-looking hands and feet like a couple of poison pups with all this colonial luggage however dillbury was obliged to take charge of her and her traps as he called them and when he was finally ready to start had got everything on the spring wagon even to the bird cages and after getting a final drink with the boys and filling a bottle to take along he loaded the old girl in and whipping up his mules disappeared in a cloud of alkali dust dillbury sat on his end of the seat frightened out of his wits and sarah jessica virginia smith sat on the other end but of course sat on all the vacant seat left by dillbury cause she couldn't help it she was built that way and was even more afraid of dillbury than he was of her although she had always been hunting a man yet she was in a wild country and a stranger not a house in sight and night coming on with a very savage looking man who was undoubtedly very drunk and acting very strangely to say the least as time went on dillbury got drier and drier and studied a good deal how to get a drink out of his bottle without letting sarah see him finally he concluded he could make some excuse that the load was slipping he might get around back of the wagon to fix it and under cover of the darkness quietly get a drink out of his bottle so when they were crossing a canyon in an unusually lonely spot he stopped the mules and muttering something about the load he started to get out but Sarah thought her hour had come, and throwing her arms, which were like pillow bolsters, around Dillbury's neck, began to scream and piteously beg him not to do her any wrong. The more Dillbury Ike tried to explain, the more Sarah Jessica cried, screamed, and sobbed, till finally, with a despairing sigh like under the collapse of a big balloon, she fainted clear away on his breast, pinning him over the back of the seat, his spinal column slowly but surely being sawed in two over the sharp edge the horror of poor old dillbury when he realized that death from a broken back was only a question of her not coming out of the dead faint which she seemed to have gotten an allopathic dose of cannot be described when some time had elapsed and she showed no signs of animation he made a great struggle to get from under her but it was a vain attempt he was nailed down as completely as a piece of canvas under a paving block and when it came over him that he was doomed to this ignominious death, when he fully realized what people would think about him when they found him in this compromising position, and the cowboys would facetiously all agree that he looked like a Texas dogie steer hanging dead on a wire fence after a Wyoming blizzard, when he felt that peculiar loud buzzing in his ears that is a premonition of death, he made one final desperate struggle and spitting out a lot of gray hair, hairpins, and pieces of switch which had accumulated in his mouth. He screamed with all the strength of his lungs in one long despairing cry the one word, Sarah! Now in Dillbury Ike's delirium and raging fever on the stock train, he kept continually giving tongue in a long, blood-curdling, soul-freezing, despairing cry to that one word, Sarah! Night and day we had to listen to that heartbroken cry finally when the fever was at its highest stage i consulted the conductor of our special about getting a doctor and he advised me to go back to the last town we had passed through where there was a good physician and get him he said that we would have plenty of time as there was a lonely sidetrack just ahead of the train so walking back about ten miles to this town i secured the services of a doctor and getting a livery rig we soon caught up with the special when the doctor had examined Dillbury's tongue and pulse and had put his ears to Dillbury's heart while he was giving one of his despairing cries for Sarah, he wrote a prescription in some kind of foreign language which he interpreted to us, as he said he had written it down as a mere form to show that he could write in a foreign language. He said our friend was very sick, and the one thing that would save his life was to get Sarah for him. Now, of course, that was an impossibility but he said all we needed was an imitation Sarah, something that looked like her and was about her size and form. So after explaining to him what Sarah was like, he drove back to town, and when he caught up to us again, brought into the car a wonderful dummy made out of a large sack of bran, with a head tied on it composed mainly of a sack of hair, such as plasterers use to mix mortar with. He had a large, but not too large, Mother Hubbard dress on this wonderful dummy, and the whole well perfumed with florida water when we laid this imitation sarah in the emaciated arms of poor old dillbury his eyes grew moist for a moment and straining it to his breast he gave a contented sigh or two whispered sarah sarah 
and dropped off into a healthy slumber, and the doctor said he would live. Eats up Sarah. Bilberry slept for a long time, and awoke somewhat refreshed, but somewhat under the influence of his animal scalp, and no one being in the car, the spirit of the goat probably overtook him as he devoured the head of the dummy Sarah, which will be remembered consisted of plastering hair. Then the spirit of the sheep and the pig coming over him, he devoured the sack of bran, and laying down in front of the stove like a Newfoundland dog, he went to sleep. Thus I found him on my return to the car. But alas, his stomach was too weak to digest all the stuff he had consumed, and in a few hours he was in a raging fever and calling for Sarah again. But of course he had devoured Sarah, and we had nothing to fix up in the place of the dummy. And while it was heart-rending to hear his sobbing cry for Sarah growing weaker, and weaker as the night wore on, yet we could only listen and hope. About four o'clock in the morning his cries stopped, and he seemed to be sleeping for a few minutes. And then he opened his eyes and took my hands, and in a weak but rational voice told me the story of his boyhood in the following words. He said he was born in the mountains in Virginia. He was the only child, so far as he knew, of a moonshiner's daughter. His mother was not an unhappy woman, he said, when she had plenty of snuff and moonshine whiskey. In fact, was quite gay at times. No one, not even his mother, knew exactly who his father was. Some people said it was a revenue officer, and some said it was the member of Congress from that district, but most people thought it was a livestock agent of one of the western railroads. However this may be, he thrived on corn pone, dewberries, wild honey, and sow bosom, and as soon as he got old enough helped his mother cut wood and haul it to town in a two-wheeled hickory cart drawn by a steer. They lived with his grandfather, who was quite a prominent man in that part of Virginia, and who was finally killed by revenue officers. His mother was sent to the pen for selling moonshine whiskey, and he was taken charge of by a family who immigrated to Utah. He said the last time he saw his darling mother, t'was at their old home in the mountains in Virginia. The steer was hitched to the cart one beautiful spring morning. The sun's rays was just kissing the mountain tops, when two revenue officers had appeared at their home, and after a lively scrap with his mother they had succeeded in arresting her. Not, though, till she had thoroughly furrowed their cheeks with her fingernails, and plenteously helped herself to sundry handfuls of their hair, after which she had peacefully seated herself in the cart and was placidly chewing a snuff-stick in each corner of her mouth, when the steer and cart disappeared around a bend in the mountain road, and fate decreed he should never see her again. The family that took charge of him were neighbor moonshiners, and had a day or so after this took place traded off their Virginia estate for a team of antique mules and a linchpin wagon, and storing a goodly supply of moonshine whiskey, applejack, cornmeal, and bacon in the wagon, loaded the family, consisting of nine children, himself included, in the wagon, and immigrated for Utah. He said as long as he was with these people he was treated like one of the family. But as they immigrated back to Virginia the next year, they left him in Utah with a poor family, and he was hungry many times, and he was always telling the children he associated with how big the dewberries grew where he came from. So the other children nicknamed him Dewberry, which was finally changed to Dillberry, and that name had stuck to him ever since. After finishing the story of his boyhood, Dillberry lay quiet for a short time, and then motioning me to bend down close to him, he whispered to me not to bury him in Nebraska where, he said, the only way a man could hope to be resurrected was in the shape of a yellow ear of corn, to be fed to a yellow steer, followed by a yellow hog, and the hog meat eaten by a yellow-whiskered malarial populist, and so on. After I promised to see that he was buried on his ranch in Utah, he asked me to sing that old cowboy song, Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roams, a place where the rattlesnake plays. The Passing of Dilberry Ike "'Twas a dismal night on a way-car, the rain pattering on the roof o'erhead. The man who has told this story was alone with the silent dead. The voice that had been calling for Sarah was hushed and stilled at last. He had finished telling the story of his childhood's checkered past. No more would he ride the ranges, no more the maverick's brand, nor subdue the bucking bronco in that far western land never again to meet the school marms when they came travelin' west under the guise of school teaching to get in a bachelor's nest dillbury folded his hands gently as he quietly went to sleep in the death that knows no waking 
for which no shipper could weep. While some of his life had been stormy, of hardships he'd had his chair, pen cannot paint a cattleman's troubles, nor picture his heart-sick care. When he's got his cattle on a special, and getting a special run, death for him hasn't a single terror, he longs for it to come. And so with poor old Dilbury, when his weary eyes closed in death, blotted out his sorrows and troubles, all blown away with his last breath. He had gone to meet his grandfather, and get some of his latest brew, for who shall say that old moonshiner had quit distilling some mountain dew? For all say the other world is better, we'll get what we like over there, while of our joys here we are stinted, in the hereafter we get double share. His eyes grew bright with a vision that he saw on the other side. He got a glimpse of a right good cow country just before he started to ride. And his eyes lit up with a gladness, his face o'erspread with hope, as without a trace of sadness his spirit rode away in a lope. End of chapter 22 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 23 of Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack by Frank Benton. Chapter 23 arrival at the transfer track of south omaha one dark dismal rainy morning a little before daylight i arrived with the remnant of our stock train on the stockyards transfer at south omaha the conductor and brakeman ordered me out of the way car so picking up my belongings i got out in the mud and rain and looked around for some shelter there was a lot of railroad tracks and switches but no houses or hotels or any one to inquire from as i had learned by experience that conductors brakemen and switchmen never give any information to stockmen in a dark rainy night so after wandering up and down the tracks for a ways and not being able to find out which way the town lay I got on top of the stock cars, and huddling down in my rain-soaked rags, I prepared to wait till daylight. The rain was very cold, and after a bit turned to snow and chilled me to the bone. But I was afraid to leave the stock cars, as I had never been there before, and was sure to get lost if I left the stock, as the town is quite a ways from the transfer. I thought of Dilbury Eye, Pat Saddle Jack, an old chuckwagon in the other world, and wondered why I should be left shivering in this awful storm, suffering the pangs of hunger and cold, while doubtless they had more fire than they really needed. No matter what their condition was in the other world, it was bound to be better than mine. Even the sheepmen's condition in the other world couldn't be much worse, though some claim there is a hell set apart a purpose for sheepmen on the other side. The Arrival of the Survivor at the Transfer My clothes were all worn out long ago. My beard had grown down to my knees, and the hair on my head, having never been cut since we started, now reached to my waist and of course it and my beard was some protection from the storm but i realized that if i stayed where i was it would only be a short time till i should meet my comrades who had gone before and i thought it would be proper to make some preparations for the other world i never had prayed or went to church much cause a cowman don't have any chance to attend to these, as there is always either some calves to brand Sundays, or else some of the neighbors coming visiting. 
but i remembered a passage of scripture i had heard when a boy and it came back to me now and kept ringing in my ears forgive thine enemy i never had an enemy in my whole life that i knew of without it was this blamed railroad and while i wasn't sure they was enemies yet they had dealt me more misery than any one except it might be this stockyards company that was keeping me and my stock out on this transfer starving and freezing in the storm after me and my steers had all got to be rip van winkles getting that far on the road i studied over the matter and could see it would be too great a job to forgive them both at the same time and of course couldn't tell how much forgiveness the stockyards company would have to have as i hadn't got through with them yet there might be so much against them before they got my cattle unloaded that it would be impossible to forgive it it was very lucky as it turned out afterwards that i had this forethought cause as i take it forgiveness only comes from the heart no matter what your lips say and your heart is the blamedest thing to control in forgiveness as well as love and when that stockyards company finally got around to bring my cattle in and unload them i reckon it would have been impossible for any mortal man with the least spark of vitality left in his veins to have forgiven them they have tried over and over to explain it to me by saying that when they built the transfer tracks and unloading chutes their receipts only run about fifteen hundred to two thousand cattle a day with about the same number of hogs and about two hundred sheep and now in the fall of the year their receipts of cattle run up to seven thousand to twelve thousand a day with the same number of hogs and twenty thousand to twenty five thousand of sheep and they are trying to handle them with the same facilities they had to start with so they are pretty near always so far behind in unloading stock in the busy season that it takes all the slack business season to finish unloading the stock that accumulated during the rush having made up my mind to put off forgiving the stockyards company till some future date i turned all my attention to forgiving the railroad company i had noticed a good many religious people when someone had done them an injury and they couldn't get at them any other way they would pray for them and while they generally asked the lord to forgive them yet they always told their side of the story in such a way that if the lord was anyways easily prejudiced he would be pretty tolerable slow about handing out any unsought for clemency to their enemies as they always started in by telling of all the mean things their enemies had ever done in order to remind the lord what a big contract it was after studying the matter over i thought this would be the proper way to pray for the railroad company but after i got started telling the lord what mean things they had done i see twas no use to try to finish unless i'd hand the matter down to future generations as one life wouldn't be long enough to get fairly started in the inferno of the transfer all night long i had heard voices on all sides of me and apparently the owners of them were in the direst distress some were praying undoubtedly but the most were cursing a few were crying and moaning with the cold and i thought for a long time i must have got into an inferno of lost souls and added to my sufferings in the storm in which i had come close to death was the terror of listening to these distressing cries 
and i longed for daylight to appear so these horrors would be explained daylight began to appear while i was thinking about these things and i could see other stock trains near me and on every train i could see one or two more miserable wretches like myself huddled down on top of a car in the snow and cold rain and the only sign of life you could detect was when they took spells of shivering one of them was pretty close and i hailed him once or twice and finally he roused up enough to answer me but the poor shivering wretch was so numb with the cold he didn't sense much of anything and when i asked him why all the shippers stayed out all night with their cattle place of going into town he said lots of times cattle were so tired when they got to omaha and they were so long about getting them to the chutes that there was more danger of their getting down after they got to the transfer and getting tramped to death than before then he said lots of stockmen who tried to get to town from the transfer in the night and had got killed and some got their legs cut off by trains that were all the time switching on the transfer tracks he said if the humane society took half the pains to protect the shippers that they did the stock being shipped he thought it would be better he said a shipper was a human being even if he did look like a orangutan just dragged out of a chicago sewer when he got through to omaha with a shipment of livestock i thought maybe he was getting personal so i told him he didn't look so fine himself that i thought anyone who resembled a jackass in a wyoming blizzard hadn't any call to make reflections on other people's looks just then the switch engine coupled onto his train and hauled him and his stock off to the unloading chutes and i was kind of glad he was gone as i had conceived a dislike to him anyway i can't bear any one who makes disagreeable reflections and comparisons on one's personal appearance when one isn't looking their best especially a person who ain't got anything to brag of themselves the farmer's prayer i looked on the other side of me and saw another stock train with a group of four or five stockmen on top of cars they were huddled down together in the snow and wet and i thought at first one of them was making a speech but soon discovered he was praying it turned out one of their number was dying from ill health and the exposure of the night before they having been there all night waiting for the switch engine to haul them to the chutes they were a bunch of nebraska farmers who had bought some feeders in omaha some time previous shipped them out to their farms a couple hundred miles west fed up their corn crop and was bringing the cattle back the man that was praying seemed to be a son and partner of the dying man and was telling the lord the whole transaction from a to izzard whether he was doing this to relieve his own feelings or whether he thought the lord would size his father up as an honest man in place of a sucker it's hard to tell anyway you could tell by his prayer that him and his dying father had got the worst of the deal all the way through what i heard of his prayer run something like this o lord thou knowest how thy humble servants have been the victims of designing and unscrupulous men thou knowest lord how a hook-nosed sheeny first induced thy poor servants to buy of him a lot of crooked-backed narrow-hipped long-tailed high on the rump eunuched dehorned southern steers and how they had kept them off of water for seven days waiting for a sail and then let them drink till their stomachs was like unto bass drums 
when they weighed them up to thy deceived servants and then o lord thy wretched servants not having any money to pay for them we had to go to a grasping commission man and o oh lord thou knowest how he did charge us usury cent per cent and all kinds of per cent how he figured up interest on the cost of the steers then figured interest on that interest then figured interest on the interest that he had figured on the interest then figured a commission for buying them then another commission for selling them then figured out the interest on the commission then figured the interest on the interest that he had figured on the commission and how when we had got these steers home two of them were dead three were cripples five were lump jaws and how their feet were so huge and they had such wise old-fashioned countenances we were behooved to look into their mouths to determine by their teeth how old they were and thy astonished servants discovered that in place of two-year-olds as was represented they were a great many times two years old and how many times when we had a little fat on their ribs they saw someone afoot and becoming frightened ran round and round the feedlots till they were poorer than ever and some there was that escaping over the fence were never seen by thy servants any more they having disappeared over the hills and in adjacent cornfields and thou knowest how we were always sober law-abiding citizens till we were inveigled into buying these imitation steers and since that time have lived in a constant round of excitement terror and riot the switch engine now coupled on to the dying man's stock train and pulled it away to the chutes so i didn't hear the last of the prayer probably his commission man heard it after he got through explaining why the steers didn't bring any more money end of chapter twenty three Recording by Bill Mosley, Lano County, Texas, USA. Chapter 24 of Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack by Frank Benton The Final Roundup Two railroad men of mighty brain, the steadfast friends of true cowmen. No matter which the first your name, we all love George Crosby and Charlie Lane. And if in this story they should see some mentioned evil, for which a remedy that's in their power and can be used, they'll fix it so the shipper is less abused of all things needed and it's a crying shame is some kind of toilet room on each stock train in regard to fires let the shippers agree whether they'll be froze or roasted into eternity have a call-boy escort with lantern bright when at division stations we come in darkest night to save our anxiety fear and doubt put us in the right way car that's going out to the stockyards company a suggestion could be made if they expect to keep and gain more trade when our cattle are delivered on their transfer track try and unload them or else we'll ship them back if one or two of these evils should be wiped away by these suggestions in this humble way then will i rejoice and forget the days of toil when i composed this work and burnt the midnight oil end of chapter twenty four end of cowboy life on the sidetrack by Frank Benton.